Hey everyone, welcome to the first ever installment of the Future Grind podcast. My name is Ryan O'Shea and our guest tonight is Tim Cannon. Tim is a well-known entrepreneur and software developer from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he's also the founder and CIO of the biotechnology startup company, Grindhouse Wetware, which uses affordable open source technology to augment human capabilities. Going forward, this podcast will focus on science, technology, business, politics, basically anything that can impact the future of the human race, which is a lot of things. But this is an introductory episode. Rather than diving deep into one particular topic, we're going to touch upon various things, mainly focusing on biohacking and transhumanism. All of our show notes can be found at our website, futuregrind.org. I'd also suggest you subscribe to our YouTube channel and our iTunes feed to make sure you don't miss anything. Make sure to like, comment, rate, and share this everywhere to really spread the word. Stick around for the end of the episode. We'll give you some tips on how you can get involved in citizen science and biohacking and maybe unlock your potential. Welcome to our debut episode. This is Future Grind. to the show. This is the first ever installment of the Future Grind podcast, and we're here at Hack Pittsburgh, a makerspace in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in our little makeshift studio here, and I'm here to welcome Tim Cannon to the show. He will be a recurring guest for us, talking about his expertise from biohacking and his company Grindhouse Wetware. Uh, so you have some implants yourself, right? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I actually have uh, several. I've actually had one removed uh, that was part of an experiment, and then I have um, a near-field communication chip for communicating with my phone. Uh, RFID for just standard opening of doors and various things like that and I have a magnet in my finger that allows me to feel and sense the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah, I noticed when you came in today to come into the hackerspace, there's actually an RFID reader on the door and you were able to just scan your hand and gain access to the building. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I got with the president of Hack Pittsburgh and I kind of said I'm kind of a forgetful idiot, which is half the reason I got this and so I'd like to go ahead and um, get my ID that's in my implant to uh to open the door and he was like no problem that's amazing and awesome because i mean that's how it is here you know they're really encouraging of all this kind of weird fun stuff so that's really uh, interesting that shows the future capabilities that are possible you know people do forget their keys or forget their cards but if something is in your hand i know there's kind of a a fear factor about that people don't want these things in their hand but you're proving that there are functional uses for this absolutely i mean even just walking outside of the hacker space if the door closes it it locks behind you right and so like that is something that any time I heard that door slam shut before this kind of thing got loaded into the system, it was just this moment of panic. Do you have your key? Right. And then, but now, I mean, that door slam shut and I'm like, good, fine, whatever. That's secure. Right. You know, so, and then I just walk up, I put my hand up there and the door lets me in. So this would all be considered biohacking. Uh, what, what, how would you define that? What does that mean to you? Well, I think biohacking is just, it's like almost any other kind of hacking uh, where you just basically come to understand how a system works and then use it in a way that is unanticipated for some benefit or other behavior that that results in that. So, for example, the fact that your hand uh, can fit these things, um, these electronic components, with no problem, uh, and there's plenty of room there, and it's really easy to implement, this is a sort of hack. It's you're, you're taking an empty space in your body that wasn't being used for anything else, and you're putting a key there, a key that no one else can get to. So it's a kind of that's a little hack. Or this finger magnet, you know, it's a little hack where I know that I can feel things and there's a lot of nerves there. I know that magnets wiggle in the presence of fields. So, therefore, understanding those two systems, I can make a connection and feel the electromagnetic field. So what you're doing is basically enhancing the human body beyond what would be natural capabilities. You're augmenting it to perform new things. Right. And there's already a biohacking industry. It's called the medical field. You know? right. So yeah. <laughs> people think, you know, oh, it's weird to have technology involved in your body. And you, that's a very logical step to take until you think, well, people have prosthetic limbs. Right. People have pacemakers. People have cochlear implants. This technology is already brought into our body. But the medical field only does it to make us up to an arbitrary definition of normal. Right. But why not biohack beyond that? Why not extend human capability? The modern medical industry is kind of focused on solving problems once they arise. Yes. So I guess what biohacking and transhumanism in general would like to do is 
maybe take care of those problems before they become problems and transcend these human limitations. Right. And that's something that a lot of people do have a sense of fear factor for. They feel like, oh, I am a human now. It's scary to become transhuman. But I think it's clear that if you could phrase that another way, that we are already transhuman. You know, as soon as language was invented and communication took place and writing happened in fire, mm -hmm. we were able to form a society based on technology. And we are kind of living through our technology and this and this feedback loop that it creates us and we create it and it goes on and on. So in the same way that, you know, we already wear glasses, we already wear clothes, we can fly in airplanes. And if someone, if you talk to someone 2000 years ago, someone who could do those things would be a transhumanist. Right. They'd be a, well, they'd be a God, right? They'd be exactly. worshiped as a God. I mean, if you go back in a time machine with a lighter, just a lighter, the ability to create fire during the stone age with the flick of your hand would be basically enough for them to be like, Oh my, you're, you're amazing. You know what I mean? And, and the, the, you couldn't explain the mystery to him because there's just so many contextual things we take for granted. So when we talk about biohacking, a lot of people, again, think it's something strange that is done. But realistically, if you drink coffee for the caffeine benefits and the stimulant effects, you are essentially biohacking. You are using something to mess with the chemistry of your body mm -hmm. to have a desired outcome. And the same thing with exercise. You know, mm -hmm. exercise is a very unnatural thing. Animals don't do it, but humans would try to form their body in a particular way to gain certain strength by doing repetitive activities for the purpose of biohacking. Yeah. Jogging is biohacking. You know, people don't understand that jogging is something that we invented, that we do, that's somewhat unpleasant for health, right? Um, and it's, it, animals don't jog and animals can be healthy, right? Um, so there's all kinds of things that we do that like where we look at the system and kind of look for these trade-offs and these little hacks or uh, ways in which we can use the system. And you see a lot of people who kind of do realize that what they're doing is biohacking, kind of along the lines of Tim Ferriss and Dave Asprey with the Bulletproof Executive, mm -hmm. who are making the bulletproof coffee to kind of hack your body in certain ways. And that's just dietary changes for the most part. Or with Tim Ferriss's example, you know, either supplements or certain teas or other things he uses for for you know, nootropic or, you know, conscious stimulating effects. And biofeedback, right? Exactly. You know what I mean? So you like, you're reading your blood, you're reading your biometrics, you're taking the supplements and you're trying to do some of that almost in real time, right? They're basically trying to hack the body to be as efficient as it possibly can with the base package, not change the base package, but ramp up all systems on all levels to the best they can be, which is also an interesting kind of thing. So coming back to the biohacking, it seems like there's a few different subsets of that in itself. You know, one is the technological route. Let's merge man and machine mm -hmm. and use, you know, hardware and technology that we make to interface the man-machine interface. And the other one is the biological. Let's, let's transcend biology. Let's regrow organs or 3D print skin or, you know, use cognitive enhanced chemistry to mm -hmm. do that rather than hardware. Uh, where do you fall on that spectrum? And do you think one is better than the other or more likely to succeed than the other? On the spectrum, I would say that I tend to fall more into the um, merge man and machine kind of spectrum because I just find genetics to be overly complex. I think we have materials that we completely understand how they work and we should use those. But um, at the same time, uh, Emil Grofstra from Dangerous Things, he, he mentioned to me uh, one time when we were having a discussion about this, he kind of said, you know... I think your thinking's too rigid. He said, I think the biological sciences are going to come to meet the machines and make us more capable of interfacing with the machines. And the machines are going to come to be more capable of interfacing with our biology. So our biology will change, and it'll change to accommodate the fact that we're mostly machine. And maybe over a long enough timeline, we just will no longer be biological. You see someone who would have an amputated leg, for example, and get a prosthetic limb, and there's cases where they realize this prosthetic limb is really good. It's better than my other leg. Mm -hmm. Can we chop off my other leg and I can have two prosthetic legs? Right. And you know, it's those people who already are in that situation that do that, but pretty soon, as the technology advances, you're gonna have people, that arm is way better than my arm. Can I get that arm? So and this is, this is reasonable, right? This is what kind of bothers me is when people like kind of recoil against this sort of thing um, because of learned behaviors and kind of like the sanctity of the body and this sort of thing, right? But like, on a very rational level, if and if there is a artificial arm that you can ease, let, let's just pretend that it's free, right? And it's an artificial arm, and it is in every way superior to yours, and has a rejection rate 
of like point zero 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 one percent. Like, I mean, it is like an ear piercing to get this thing done, and vastly superior. In what? world is it not rational to to take that leap and and limbs are one thing where it's not really going to kill you but if you get into artificial organs you know your biological heart is going to go bad yeah. that is a fact mm -hmm. and so to a lot of people who do have you know organ replacements or implants or you know get it from a cadaver or something they typically get to the point where it's going to go bad i'm going to die shortly maybe i almost already did die i need a new organ Whereas if you have the artificial organs made, the synthetic biology or the technology ones, you could implement that into your already healthy heart, replace it, mm -hmm. and be good to go for an indefinite amount of time. Right. And, and, and it's kind of silly, too, because we, you know, we're replacing uh, human hearts with other human hearts. So we, we already know that there's like going to be a shelf life in the one that we're actually putting in there. And, uh, you know, it just almost seems like there should just be much more research being dumped into perfecting the artificial heart and just making, because, the, the, I mean, it's just the cheaper, I mean, it's just cheaper. You, and right now there's only one source of human hearts, and that's humans, right? And so, like, that seems, it just seems unreasonable. And then, I mean, if you were doing that, I mean, you'd expect stupid things like giant lists of people waiting to get hearts from other humans who were, they were kind of secretly hoping to die. And that would be weird, right? You know, um, and so, like, this is the kind of thing we, we really need to focus on the idea that biology is, a, well, at least for me, biology is mostly a tangled mess. And... Um, engineering, it seems, much more efficient and obviously cheaper and uh, obviously better. So I don't see why people get so queasy about it. But I think really it, it comes comes down to the fact that there's a social idea that there is magic in the meat, right? That the fact that your brain is made of wet, gooey stuff, right, is the, is what makes you you. And even though your cells are replaced, you know, cell for cell every seven years, you're not the same stuff people get queasy about taking away the meat and replacing it with something that is, by all logical accounts, superior. And a lot of that might be rooted in religious belief, uh, whether, you it's know, a god is, or yeah. a god's created this, intelligently created your perfect human body to be placed here on earth to live out his will or do what the gods want or anything like that. Uh, but, I mean, anyone looking at the human body can see that it's not a very intelligently designed thing. I mean, the example that's often used is, you breathe and eat through the same tube. Right. How many people does that kill a year? You, right. That's not a good design. Statistically, people will die every year because of this poor design. And you also have all these vestigial organs, you know, the appendix or tonsils. They, they don't do anything to you until they kill you. Right. And so, you know, the, the human body is this, like, massively frail thing. Once you recognize that a organ is vestigial, the, the common sense thing to do is to remove it. I don't have an appendix, right? Because mine tried to kill me. That's probably a bad design flaw, something we could easily do something about. There's a cultural idea that it is hubris to think that we can do better than nature when we are constantly doing better than nature. There is this idea that it is not okay to mess with nature, even through science and, and many other people, like, you know, you, you find it in even logical realms, right? Where people just say, oh, I don't know about that. And, you know, I could just picture people saying the same thing when we were getting ready to walk out of Africa. Oh, I don't know if we should go out there. I think there might be dragons. There's no dragons. They're not there. They never are. But this is something that, you know, looking into transhumanism, which is what all of this biohacking and everything we talked about so far would fall under. You know, transhumanism is an interesting thing. It's basically expanding beyond what it is to be human and becoming something more. But we've been doing that since we left Africa, you know, mm -hmm. since humans evolved from the, whatever we were previously to now. You have been, you made fire, you make language, you make technology, and that technology is a feedback loop that then, you know, influences the next generation and how they think. So we're already transhumanists. I think if you would go a thousand years ago and ask someone, you know, what would a transhumanist be? They wouldn't know the word, first of all. But right. to imagine someone flying in the sky in a plane or going to the moon or communicating virtually with like kind of a telepathic presence to another human across the world through your phone, that's transhumanism. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the definition of transhumanism. But we think of it as normal now. 
the word transhumanism, I kind of have a problem with it because I think even when we are merging with machine and we have prosthetic limbs and technology all through us and we can 3D print and replace organs or improve organs at will, I don't think these people will consider themselves transhuman, right? Because they are, they are at the same level that we are compared to thousands of years ago. Right. So you'd always consider yourself, I feel like, human at some point. Well, yeah, you're going to have a bar, right? And then there's going to be people above and below that particular social uh, norm. And, and I think, it, like you're saying, it's just, it's going to follow just the same trend as everything else did. And it's just some of these things that move these ideas forward have to take on a movement-like kind of um, direction, right? They have to act as a movement. You know, the civil rights um, is probably something that that's, was going to happen over the long enough timeline, but putting a name on it and directing it forward allows the social norm to go that direction. And so I think that's why transhumanism is a word and needs to be an idea, because it's it's a stated direction that we would like to take humanity. Humanity is always going to consider itself humanity, but what direction we go is very important. So when people are scared of what's coming in the future, oh, I, it's going to be weird. We're going to lose our humanity. We're going to still be human. We're, we're gonna just going to be. We're going to be more human. This is the this is the ridiculous thing. Humans are complex, right? And our complexity is part of what defines us. And the further our technology goes, the more ranges of possibility there are, which makes us compoundingly more complex and compoundingly more different and compoundingly more unique every iteration, right? This idea that we're going to lose our uniqueness when we get more possibilities, it's crazy, right? You want to know when we were all the same? When we didn't have reading and writing, we were all the same. We all died of our teeth. We all bred with absolute with our cousins, right? You know what I mean? We ate what was on the ground, right? We were all the same then, and our choices were none. Now, we have a, 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 a dazzling, I mean, to, to, to the caveman, what would seem like an impossible amount of capability and choice and humanity. Because, you know, what we don't do a lot of anymore, you know, is like choke each other to death over women, Right? Or food. Right? Not, you know what I mean? Not, not, as, not even close to how it was. In the, I mean, there is not even remotely the amount of violence. Right? And remotely the amount of injustice. Right? There's still tons of injustice. There's still tons of work to be done in humanity. And I think that what we look at is the more technology and the more education and the more ideas and the more choices that we create in this world the easier it is to vanquish those injustices because they come from ignorance, right? And that's, that, I mean, that's the name of the game. And people don't realize that because I think with the inundation of news and media and that you can find anything you're looking for, people don't realize that we're living in the best time in history. You know, <laughs> violence is at an all-time low. Poverty is at an all-time low. Yeah. You can. My this... favorite is when people go, oh, it's getting real bad out there. And I'm like, not statistically. You know what I mean? Like, what are you talking about? Crime is down to record level lows. I mean, seriously. And you bring up an interesting point there, and it was something we can dive into on future episodes. There's so many topics we're just touching on now. But the directed evolution, the fact that we kind of have been guiding our own evolution for, for years now, whereas no, for humans really no longer face, I guess, survival of the fittest, even the unfit among us are able to survive with modern medicine. Mm -hmm. We can make sure that their disabilities are taken care of and they can survive. So that's something that'll be interesting to see where we take evolution in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Survival of the fittest. Well, you know, yeah, we're, we're above that kind of genuine survival because that's not what our goals are anymore, right? Survival of the fittest, fit to what? fit to, for a cutthroat world with, with finite resources and, and the only way to succeed is to make sure that you other species starve and you don't? That's not a game I want to play. I don't want to even be involved in that system. I mean, yeah, observe it scientifically from a distance. It's pretty fascinating. But I don't want to be in competition with the crocodile genome. It's, it'll, kill, it'll crush me. It's good, the crocodile's going to outlive us all you know, if we stay this way. So what do you think you'll see going forward? What are you most excited about that's a project that's in the works or that you think has the most potential to help humanity within the near future? 
Well, I mean, within the near future, I, I think you have um, a lot of people kind of doing things in terms of like artificial organs. I think those are those are really big. Like any kind of replacement or prosthetics for parts that are going bad, I think is is huge. But I think on the same token, you also have kind of uh, people like us who are trying to, um, you know, make things to begin to extend the idea of the body and what what constitutes the body and the person, right? So, for example, uh, I know you and I have talked about this before, but uh, where the circadia device, right, it's kicking out my temperature, right? And then I can create, I can take a a nest or some sort of Wi-Fi enabled um, thermostat in my house, and if I get cold my house gets warm. And if I get warm, my house turns down that. Well, at that point, my body and the house will come to meet one another. Therefore, my house is actually part of my regulation system. It's part of my body at that point. I become at least partly my house. And um, I think that that is going to really extend our thinking into what what is humanity and what we can be this is practical transhumanism this is the kind of concept of finding little hacks that can start to teach us about what is potentially possible in a broader spectrum and what it's like living when you've opened up these new perceptions for yourself and new windows into your body. I think we find this advantage with like things like the Fitbit. I think we find this advantage with things like the finger magnet. Um, I think that these are the kind of things that when you, and when you start to look at those things and aggregate that data, you can find different ways to use them and it compounds on itself, just like technology. The more discoveries we make, the more interesting discoveries we can make. And you know, consciousness is defined as the awareness of your surroundings and the awareness of your environment. Mm -hmm. So when you use things like a finger magnet, and you know, using that with neuroplasticity, where you're not a, you're not really gaining a sixth sense, right? You're it's a fifth sense. You're using the sense of touch, mm -hmm. but to get new data through the sense of touch, you're really more conscious. You're more aware of your surroundings. Yep. So when you connect that to something like if you can feel electromagnetic fields, that's one thing. But when I saw the bottlenose device that Grindhouse has, well, yeah, there's a you know there's this kind of concept of like new user interface and and thinking about how we interface with. Um, uh, people, you know, I mean, Fitbit definitely, for example, is studying simple conceptual interfaces that are not as visual as, say, your cell phone is, right? And so it, the bottlenose is an example of this where you can take a small hack to your body uh, by putting a magnet somewhere in, in implanted in your skin, coated with something safe, and you can activate that magnet in certain patterns and convey certain concepts. Uh, and that sounds kind of thick, so a very practical example would be that if you have a, a distance sensor set up on something, the closer something comes to that distance sensor, the more it would vibrate your magnet, the further away it got, the less. Everybody can understand this simple concept, so you can immediately close your eyes and tell whether something's approaching you or leaving you, and you can tell roughly how close it is with your eyes closed, just sensing through this magnet. So now... Naturally, what we did was said, okay, well, could you actually do hard data? You can use those electromagnetic fields to input data from radiation or ethyl alcohol or heat. Numbers. Distance, we, we actually, numbers. We, we can actually transmit numbers and stuff now. So, like, we can send a text stream through your finger, right, so that it's just complete passive knowledge kind of entering your body in a way not that, that is not require your eyes to sit and stare at it, which your eyes are the most, like, important... Uh, sensory organ that you have and they should really be reserved for things like social engagement and um, you know analyzing threats and things like that you don't you shouldn't need your eyes to know exactly what temperature it is or what somebody's saying to you via text message right that should just really you need the data so we figured out ways to do that just using these finger bags. and you see the problems like distracted drivers or all the time you see people complaining oh we're at a social gathering and everyone's on their phones mm -hmm. well when you have this technology with with the bottlenose device and you can send information at first you would feel it right you would feel it in your finger but after a while that becomes subconscious almost yep. telepathic oh well, so and so is saying were, this yeah. to me the They're, tests were ridiculous the test runs that we did like i mean we had four or five i think it was five people in the lab with magnets and Everybody got over like an 80% on their first attempt at detecting numbers, 
right? So we just we gave them the chart and let them try to do this the random test, and it was ridiculously intuitive. So I can't imagine it takes very much practice. Yeah. So I think you just made a lot of uh, college students and gamblers very excited with the concept <laughs> of being able to send numbers silently to yourself sub- <coughs> and reading them subconsciously. So that's one of the things that you know you look at going forward and potential uses of this that people could get anonymous or you know subconscious silent data transferred across a room or depending on how it's emitted and you see one of the problems you could get like what if you're walking on the street and advertisers find out about this and you can get ads pumped into your finger and mm-hmm. you can't stop them Is right that- oh of course uh, of course there is no technology that that can't be used for both good or ill it's just it's simply technology is just simply an application of some sort of science scientific principle right it's just some and so that can always be used because people interpret good and bad science just does what it does the artificial pancreas was shown to be hackable and the guy was capable of delivering 45 days of insulin in one shot without triggering the internal alarm this was presented at defcon a couple years back and it was like anybody paying attention should have understood that that without triggering the internal alarm that means that somebody could make a political assassination and it would look like a malfunction and nobody would ever be the wiser, right? And that should be scary. So we do need to investigate these techniques. It's important. It's important that we talk about that and have that as a conversation. But nobody, no technology has ever been stopped because of the security risk or else we wouldn't have nuclear power, right? We wouldn't have much of the things we have, right? We have decided as a society that in many cases, innovation is worth the risk. I think anyone would agree that, you know, planes can crash and cars can crash and these things that doesn't make this technology not worth pursuing and the net benefit for people everywhere is much better. Absolutely. So, I mean, if you look at the number of automobile fatalities that happen every year, that's that's the number of people that it's worth it to die that we have cars. Right? I mean, as, as a society, we've decided that, right? It's okay that that many people die in cars so that we can all get to our jobs in Starbucks faster. And Sam Harris makes that argument, too. He mentions that we could eliminate automobile fatalities almost completely by but making the speed limit five miles an hour. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but does anybody want to do that? No. So it's okay that these, you know. And, and, and again, this is a, a responsible conversation about a society that's taking risks and determining what collateral damage. That, and, and nobody thinks about it that way. But maybe they should. Right. And then we can have these conversations in a responsible way and say, is there too much collateral damage from this? How can we mitigate that? How can we do do anything that we can do to not take away freedoms, but really mitigate as much risk away from something as possible should be the conversation. There are some things that even I would be like, like if somebody's like, oh yeah, I want to just make a nuclear bomb just to, you know, see what it's like. I'd probably be not for that. Like, I'd be like, you don't get that freedom. I'm sorry. You know, and because the collateral damage involved in the risk is just far too great. It's one guy who could screw up virtually any part of the process and wipe out, like, parts of the world are not allowed to be lived in anymore for a while. That's too much right that's too much collateral damage well we could do a whole episode on fermi's paradox and i think i'm sure we will at some yeah. point but that's one of the things people talk about is the reason that we don't find alien life which mathematically and probability wise should exist is because did they get to the point where they made a technology that wiped them out instantly did right. they find something that destroyed their race and right. i think uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens to humans when we get to these points that will we discover something that is so dangerous that it's not worth the risk right. A lot of this technology isn't accepted yet. People don't have the free ability to alter their own bodies as they see fit. And, you know, a lot of these regulations are very much justified. How, what do you think the, the path going forward to that is and how we should address that? Well, I think the, path go, the, the correct path going forward is the least likely one, which is a well-reasoned conversation where we talk about what type of collateral damage as a society we're willing to accept for this sort of freedom. But we're not allowed to talk about freedoms like that, right? We don't think about the fact that we feel that the freedom to skydive is worth any amount of skydiving accidents that could happen. And the objective is to reduce skydiving accidents as much as possible. But if somebody bounces off the ground, (sighs) skydiving's fun. That guy should have pulled the cord, you know, right? And so we're willing to accept a certain amount of collateral damage. 
I think that having a well-reasoned conversation about what sort of collateral damage we're willing to accept as a society in order to have this liberty is what we need to, is what we need to do. And I think we need to get philosophers, and I think we need to get religious people, and I think we need to get scientists, and I think we need to get society engaged in that conversation. I, don't, I haven't seen that particular strategy employed on any other social problem that we've had so far, so I'm not holding out hope. But it's slowly becoming, you know, ubiquitous in, in the culture in general that this thing is coming. I feel like it's known in the, the upper echelons, you know, the business people, the one, the thought leaders, have known this for a while and have been talking about. You see people like Elon Musk or Ray Kurzweil. Or well, I went, to, I went to that World Business Dialogue, right? Uh, and this was in, in Germany, and it was um, the top 0.1% of students from 70 countries going to get lectures from business and industry leaders and innovators of today. Right? Um, so the 1%, they're interested, right? I, I, did a, I did a speech at a castle. That was weird, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? I, you know, I was speaking next to people named, you know, Dr. Professor something something, right? You know, so it was, you know, the, the, and, and the people who, you know, put on the party, they were like, this is our castle. We bought it because we wanted a castle. Right? You know what I mean? And that's the kind of people. And I was doing a speech on that. There was a speech on ampokines. There was a speech on genetic age research. There was another one on implantable technology. Another one on, um, you know, space exploration and preparing the human body for space exploration, the medicine of space. The 1% are fucking interested. The and upper echelons of technology are interested in transhumanism. They want to know what people have to say. John Q. Public, I mean, I don't think a lot of people, you know, are interested in getting this message along because it's understood that this is going to gain people a ton of power. People who in institute this early and often are going to have the advantage. And you see a lot of conspiracy theorists about that. This technology won't be available to the normal public. It'll be available only to the 1%, only to the super rich. But you see, for you, example, with Grindhouse Wetware. I mean, you are making this technology affordable and open source. Anyone can see it. And I think that's the route we need to go. If you miss the boat on this, it's because you didn't get on the boat. The right. boat is here. Anyone yeah. is welcome to get on the boat, whether yeah. you have no money or whether you're a multimillionaire. And the billionaires and millionaires are the ones that are a lot of the ones that are interested in this because they see the potential. You look at the 2045 initiative, which is basically just a Russian billionaire trying to live forever. And, you know, and the thing is, you, know, you, you hear all these academics and they kind of say like, Oh, you know, the problem is if you want to do any of the real exciting cutting-edge research and work, right, you have to bow to the man and you have to follow their rules and, and borrow their equipment. And it's like, man, we could build our own equipment for cheaper. The 3D printer and the maker community has proved this triple time. You get a bunch of people working on an open source project, you will reduce the cost of equipment many, many fold in such short order, it will make your head spin. We could be doing this like this. But unfortunately, everybody has this localized thinking of, I want to do the best research. Right? At Grindhouse, one of the things we accepted was, our research is going to be capped by the equipment we have to test it. Some of that we're going to have to make ourselves because it's cheaper than buying the most awesome stuff. We have to prove something. Can we prove it scientifically? If yes, can we make it? If yes, can we do it cheap? If yes, fuck yes! Right? And that's how it should be. That's how we should be trying to approach this problem, is crowdsourcing it, which means that we need tons of academics abandoning this bowing to these sorts of rules and beginning to figure out how to get into the maker communities and build these pieces of equipment that are instrumental. You know, chemostats and 3D printers and, uh, you know, uh, PCRs and, you know, these sorts of... Uh, building blocks that people need, you know, photo etching equipment and, and teaching how that works uh, so that people can build their own circuits and prototype quickly, cheaply. That's what we need. And it's clear that while this is still in its early stages that this is spreading to the public, you see things like the Transhumanist Party now, the political organization with Sultan Isfahan running for the presidency, and there's various that other people. That guy's awesome, by the way. I really like him. Yeah, do, doing great things, bringing, really being an advocate of spreading this word to people and letting people know that you know, we should fund this, basically. Let, why aren't we funding this? Why is the aren't thing we that's... funding this? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It... Well, it, 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 and that's, a, like, I love it when he posts shit, like, like, um, 
I'm not trying to make more jobs. I'm trying to make less people have to work. Exactly. You know, that's a message. When you have people doing menial jobs, yep. no one should have to do monotonous, repetitive work that a machine to do so that they could survive or so that they could buy health care or buy education or live. Held hostage by your belly. You know, and I hate this concept in our society that this is okay. You know what I mean? And, and then even, he, especially here in America, where you kind of have this kind of capitalist notion where everybody kind of ignores the fact that our roads are totally socialist. And when you tell somebody that, they go, well, you need the roads. And you're like, you don't need food? You don't need medicine? I mean, those seem like they even are more important than roads. And right? people think this is a zero-sum game. You know, that... If oh. someone else gets in, someone else gets an education, gets health care, that's health care and education that I don't get. But you don't realize that if someone else gets an education and they cure cancer, you don't have to worry about cancer anymore. The, exactly. This is the, I mean, and it's hard to not. I mean, but we're animals, right? We're animals, so we're gonna think of we we don't realize it. But you see, it's hard for people to understand that you're tuned to think in ways that justify the behavior that will perpetuate your genetic line, right? Not, not, you don't realize you're doing it. Whatever it is that your brain reaches for, right, it's never going to come up with like, well, you're just cheating because you want your genetics to do better, right? It's going to be whatever, however your brain thinks. And if your brain didn't think that way, we wouldn't have survived the ice age and what have you. But, but now that's not as useful. And so we need to start encouraging this, this perspective of like, hey, man, we are all in this together. And one of the things that Zoltan always talks about in the Transhumanist Party in general that I really agree with is we're spending billions of dollars trying to defeat terrorism. And really, how many people die from terrorists? Like, financially speaking, just logically, how many people die of heart disease? How many people die of sicknesses? And you're spending billions of dollars, maybe trillions of dollars, mm -hmm. for a war against an ideology. When that's a tactic. It'd be like a war against flanking. You know, war against flanking. And you have you have extremism, and one of the root causes of extremism is ignorance, lack of education, lack of understanding and rational thought. So if you want to solve extremism, fund education. Instinct is to go. Those people are just so irresponsible. It, it, we're we're painting we're painting an animal behavior problem as a as a social responsibility problem, and that is never going to work, right? And that's part of why transhumanism is. Uh, again, an approach that is going to solve problems in a much more effective way because transhumanism is a framework for thinking about yourself as flawed in an objective way and taking an animal behavior perspective on how to solve a problem. How do I get my dog to stop attacking and biting people and e eating every rabbit it sees and all this sort of thing? And it's like, how much does it eat? Well, if it never eats, I bet it bites the shit out of you. You know what I mean? And that's that's the problem. We don't view ourselves as flawed animals. We view ourselves as, like, gods of creation because we've been able to, like, slap together stone and wood effectively for a couple thousand years. Right? Pat on the back. Well, you look at other things that have been kind of fringe at first and then gained mainstream acceptance, a lot of the body mod community, tattoos in general, some some piercings. And you see some people who are even against that, you know, the people who are extreme body modification people that split their tongues or mm -hmm. get the elf ears or full body tattoos, and they still get some resentment from society for that from, from people who have dyed hair and acrylic nails and, you know, silicone implants. Right, so, yeah, yeah. So there is just a societal level of we accept these changes to your body and these ones are a little bit off. But mm -hmm. at some point, you know, with a body autonomy and people gaining control of what they want to do to their body, mm -hmm. people are going to be able to experiment more and express themselves more through their bodies. Absolutely. It'll move forward in that way. However, when you talk about all of those communities that blazed those trails, it was uncomfortable for all of them, right? Nobody did that stuff without having there to be people before them that said, Oh, I wasn't allowed to get a job because I have a, t a throat tattoo, and I was, and these people wouldn't let me eat in their restaurant because of the way that I looked, and these sorts of um, negative experiences that come from forcing society to deal with the fact that this is your right and this is your right to change it, and uh, it's unfortunate that society can't again just have the well-reasoned conversation that's required, but you know this is what it is. And speaking as someone who has no piercings or no tattoos at all, I mean, I, but I totally understand why someone would. Yeah. 
And uh, I think one of the great things we have now is people feel more at home in their body, and that's a great thing we're going to see going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's, it's critical that we, we talk about that sort of stuff, it, that, that, the, that we live in a world now where you can be more how you feel on the inside than ever before. And, and, the, and that should be a really, really positive thing for people. I don't understand why that's frightening. The fact that we live in a world where we have more choices in the ways in which we can express ourselves, both inwardly and outwardly, it seems like a great benefit to me. Uh, so you said earlier that you had some things that you might want to tell people who were interested in getting into biohacking or hacking their daily life to, to learn more about this process and get familiar with it. And what, what would you say to those people? Well, basically, in my opinion, what you want to do is kind of like browse around and find something that you think is is interesting and sounds like an interesting experience that you'd want to have. And then at that point, once you find the, the, the hack that you want to, to work on something, most people go for a finger magnet because it is so easy and so powerful of an example because these fields are everywhere and you can immediately see how to use them for other things. And so, but... Whatever your hack is, whether it's, you know, some kind of nootropics or exercise or whatever, learn about it. Learn about what it would take to accomplish that goal and learn about the surrounding sphere. Find the communities that are discussing it. Go to Reddit. Go to these places. Absorb as much knowledge about it as possible because that's what's going to make you a good hacker. That, the more you know about, the more you can take all these different ideas from all these different spheres and connect them in unexpected ways, the more unique um, things that you're going to find. And, and that, this is about curiosity. It's about exploring um, the, the sorts of experiences that are possible now with technology. So what you want to do is have a good foundation of, of what's possible so that you can kind of put things together ad, ad hoc and, and use them. And this is definitely something that many of the hackers that you'll see are, are doing. Tim Ferriss is using the, um, his ability to track his blood statistics and things like that, and he's interested in tracking his sleep, and he has the ability to do that. And so now he's using it in unexpected ways to see if he can maybe get a more efficient type of sleep or uh, do something different with macronutrients nutrients that increases a positive property in the blood but you have to know about blood and macronutrients and how to you know what I mean how to how to sample those things you have to learn about all of those things so it is a, a lot about self-education and finding uh, communities for collaboration and that sort of thing but they're out there and they exist and it's not there's not a lot of overhead it really just takes passion and willingness to read a lot and one thing that people do have to be worried about, I think, is you know, there's a lot of experts, like you mentioned, Tim Ferriss, who's doing some interesting things, and then there's Bulletproof Coffee with you know, Dave Asprey, and then you have Stephen Kotler, who talks about hacking the flow state and getting into these things. And these, are, I would say, are, you know, they have some science behind them, but there's a lot of people out there that are the, the woo factor. The, yeah, woo-woo. The, the woo-woo guys that, you know, oh, use this magnet that will, this rare earth magnet will make sure that the energies from the pyramids help you do things. Right, yeah. yeah. And that you, so, oh, your chi is all messed up. Exactly. <laughs> right, yeah. So a lot of times some of this transhumanist stuff blends into the world of, that you need to keep that separation there. You need to be scientifically literate to be like, is there data to back this up? Is this something that is logical and can be proven. Clinging to facts and the scientific method is going to be your life raft if you're going to enter biohacking. It's a life raft. It's, it's, a, it's a fixed point. And if you don't want to submit to the facts and you really believe that you're right about something, you have to understand that that means it's your duty to prove it. The burden of proof is on. Absolutely. And, so, and not just a little proof. I don't just have to prove reference one wrong. I have to prove reference 1 through 237 wrong in an objective, repeatable, scientific way. And that's what you have to do. You have to stick to the scientific method. And, you know, as far as people going out there and doing this themselves, I would definitely support looking into transhumanism and oh, yeah. biohacking and getting involved in citizen yeah, science. biohack me, and uh, they have, like, a Facebook group. Uh, there are uh, several. You can check out the Grindhouse Wetware page, or you can always contact us through Facebook and various, and like, any of the social medias. We have them all. And uh, there's several other groups, so just kind of look around and, and um, you know, see if there's even a hacker space near you, because hacker spaces are amazingly supportive of of biohacking. Well, that's great information, and we look forward to diving into that further in future episodes. So we'll wrap that up now, and thanks for coming in. All right. Hey, everyone. We hope you enjoyed our first ever installment of the Future Grind podcast. Once again, all of our show notes can be found at our website at futuregrind.org. 
We have a lot of great guests lined up for upcoming episodes, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel and our iTunes feed so you don't miss anything. And this is very important. Please like, comment, rate, and share this. Leave us your feedback to let us know what you thought, what guests you'd like to see, and what topics you'd like to see discussed. We hope to see you next time on Future Grind.